I'm scared of walking out of this room and never feeling the rest of my whole life the way I feel when I'm with you. Ladies, gentlemen, and variations thereupon, this is Modern Escapism. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is Oodles and joining me today is Stig, Candy, Biggie and Gadget. I want to take this opportunity now just to have a little refresh. Usually I do a random crazy script and stuff, but I'm conscious that we are getting new listeners that hear the openings to these podcasts and think, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> <laughs> so Together we are Modern Escapism, the podcast that critics are calling the gold standard of podcasting. And this episode is produced by our lovely patrons. Before we get into the show, though, please consider becoming one of our sexy, incredibly cool patrons to help us divide and conquer the podcasting world. Details are in our show notes, but mainly check out our website, modernescapism.co.uk, for more exquisite content and links to everything we do. Become a patron. Become a producer once a month. Come on. (sighs) Become a patron. What an, what an honour. What an honour. Biggie will come around and rub your nipples. <laughs> yeah, speaking of, speaking of the <laughs> big his. man himself, it is time for Biggie's Breaking News. You may already know, but he doesn't, because it's time for Biggie's Breaking News. That's right, the gaming world has gone wild, wild, I tell you as the next-gen update for The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt is finally coming on December the 14th, free for everyone who already owns the game. The PS5 edition will feature dozens of visual performance and technical enhancements over the original. This includes things like ray tracing support and faster loading times. But this is where things get interesting. There's a mention of a variety of mods integrated into the experience. The complete edition will come with new additional content inspired by the Witcher series from Netflix. This could include things like armor sets or maybe even fresh cosmetics for Geralt. Playing as Luke Hemsworth. Give up Liam Liam Hemsworth. Liam Hemsworth, that's it. Luke's the other one. (laughs) Don't care. None of them. (laughs) See, uh, the PS5 version has to have something because otherwise, why would you? You just go, I'll just get the PS4 version and upgrade it for free. And upgrade it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So I've been waiting on the PS5 version. So I've not played it, so I was like, I really want to play mm. it. And then I heard that the PS5, was, they were doing like a proper, special, old singing, old yeah. dancing version. I thought, well, I might as well wait for that then. Actually yeah. get some use out of the console. Um, <clears throat> but it, yeah, we'll have to wait and see what the price point of this is going to be. Because if, if it's just a case of a few cosmetics, then I'm like, eh, I'll just get the PS4 version. Mm. Yep. It's so very cheap. Everywhere. Yeah, yeah, will be. I'll definitely do Great the uh, DLCs with the upgrade. I think I've not played them, so yeah, what? I didn't. That's the best content. I say the DLCs are fucking amazing. It's better than the main game. Exactly, saving the best for last. Crackers. Man. It's been no years, <laughs> man. <laughs> years, <laughs> years. Yeah, but when I finally got into uh, The Witcher Three, yeah, I just I, I got well into it, and I, I just did all the side stuff. I didn't do everything, but it felt like I had. The um, uh, I mean, needed a break. You can get the uh, Game of the Year edition, which is the complete edition on PS4 for thirty four ninety nine on the PlayStation Store. You can get it much cheaper from elsewhere. You might as well just get that and upgrade because it, it's it, if it is just it's just going to be DLC stuff, and unless uh, I can't even think of anything yes. I'd want, I'd, I'd want from like no. net- Netflix content. The game's got yeah. enough. The game's got anyway. enough content. I mean, my Sexy first Henry playthrough Cavill. of the full game and the DLCs was nearly 100 hours. Mm. Naked Henry it's Cavill. It's always on sale as well. Naked Henry Cavill, then I will buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly next. Uh, well, sticking with uh, CD Projekt, uh, Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Liberty will be a paid expansion. Boo. The PR director confirmed this recently. Uh, he didn't comment on how much it will be, but it's likely to be less than um, of the, traditionally the full price game. So we shall see. We made a we lot of get, money from that game. We should get that for free. The amount of times we've yeah. talked about that fucking game on this podcast. <laughs> I know. 
I I genuinely did not like the game. Biggie, do you have a direct line to CDPR's uh, PR team? Yeah. <laughs> if only. No, I, I just <laughs> grab these. Why would you want to work for that place? PR team, mate? They had a nightmare. <laughs> They've had a nightmare. Fuck that. I can imagine. I can imagine. I mean, it, was it a surprise for people that it was a paid expansion? Because I don't think they ever said that all the expansions were going to be free. I think they no, said at the they beginning didn't. they did. No, they said, they said the uh, subsequential uh, drops are going to come every other month. Subsequential uh, right. doesn't mean DLC, mm. does it? Yeah, because I mean, it, cause, it cause they makes just did sense. The, DLC in it. Yeah, they just didn't they do the thing that they did with The Witcher 3 where they just had like cosmetic yeah. DLC that came out every couple of weeks afterwards? You've got to remember when Witcher 3 first came out, you couldn't get his hair cut. Until a week after, when they dropped it, and you can get his hair cut. Stuff like that. Mate, when The Witcher 3 came out, you couldn't access the menus at a, at a frame rate above a slideshow. No. <laughs> no. That's weird. About I chose one of his different haircuts and then ended up going, just going back to the original anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Next. Uh, we're speaking of nightmares. Sony has published a patent that suggests that it's exploring ways of the um, history of in-game assets using the blockchain and NFTs, you fuckers. Ooh. <laughs> well, um... <laughs> the patent is titled Tracking Unique In-Game Digital Assets Using Tokens on a Distributed Yay. Ledger. Apparently, it could be a mechanism for tracking the changes to in-game assets, including ownership, visual appearance, and metadata. Nice. Why are they pushing this? Why, why are people pushing? Why are companies pushing this? Nobody likes it. I just Ever. don't get it. Because they think they can no make money out of it. No one has been happy about it. Do they reckon? If oh, yeah. I reckon every company in the world had this big super meeting, like a like a G eight summit, and they've all sat down and gone, "We need to push NFTs to the world." They won't like it for years, but one day they'll just get bored of it and just accept it. Well, the, 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 the blockchain will be a thing. Now, the the, the thing is, like the the hype for NFT. I, th- I think what has happened is like the hype for NFTs that came out. What was it last year? Like a lot of the corporate people then jumped on it, seeing that all these people making money off like the board Ape Yacht Club and shit like that. And then because of how slow things go in corporate world and how long it takes to get something spun up, this stuff has mm. taken 18 months to come down the line and then become a thing that hits the news. But the NFT bubble has already burst. Like there's there's loads of stories out there, like like someone like Logan Paul bought a, um an NFT for like six hundred and forty thousand dollars. And it's worth six hundred dollars now. You know, like the bubble has significantly Good. burst. It's like ninety-two percent less activity and less value in NFTs now than there were just like summer last year. So imagine them, but them poor lads, them them big monster energy lads that sat down and bought these server farms, and now there's a win. Fuck. Well, yeah, cause, crap. Because that's it as well. Because <laughs> you, you can't you can't crypto mine in China anymore. They banned it. No. Exactly. So like. The, the bubble's gone out of the market, then you have all like the different crypto exchanges that have collapsed, like two have collapsed in the last week. Um, yeah, the bubble's kind of bursting on this ship, but I think it's all coming out in the last kind of few months for corporate stuff because it just takes so long to work through a business. I, I blame Hideo Kojima for this, all of it, because I'd not really heard of the blockchain and stuff like that until Death Stranding came out, and that game's all about connecting. So I think it's him. I think he inspired the world. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> he didn't mean to. Correlation mean does to. not equal causation. I reckon it does. Guilty <laughs> until proven innocent. Always. All right. Next. Well, talking about inspiration, Twitch streamer, and forgive me for this, uh, I think it's Dinosingil? Dinosingil? I can't quite pronounce his name. What you anyway. He was overcome with emotion after successfully beating, are you ready for this? Demon Souls, Dark Souls, Dark Souls 2, Dark Souls 3, Bloodborne, Sekiro, and Elden Ring, back to back, without taking a single hit in the process. That's 120 days, seven games, no hits. This feat took him some four months to achieve. The rules are quite simple. Beat each game consecutively and start over entirely if you take a hit. <laughs> Fucking hell. Yeah, uh, and he was overcome with emotion. Get a life. (laughs) Sorry, but like, get a life, get a wife. Just insane. It's an insane feat, but fucking hell, man. Just, I mean, it's his it's his job. He's made a name for himself doing ridiculous Souls game, Souls challenges. Like, he's been the first. He's he's he started doing them when Dark Souls three came out. You know, running Demon Souls all the way up to the end of Dark Souls three. 
And every time a game has come out, he's just he's he's done that. He's tried to get through all the games in a row without taking a hit. And he's, he's getting paid for it. Then. Yeah, he's yeah. getting paid for it. It's his job. But it's it's really impressive when you see it because obviously he does like you say four months took him to to get it. Um, when you actually see him get that last hit on the Elden Beast and get that last um, cut scene in, like the the, the lads are wreck because he's been. Daddy, you couldn't do that fucking last boss without me. Never mind not getting it. Well, I know. It, it, don't throw they a shade awful. at me. <laughs> were, no, I'm saying it. We're awful. It's it's it's. it's it, a, I'm saying it's an annoying for him. Boss, it's yeah. a big. It's a big thing if he if he can do it. Yeah. Fuck. I mean, he's he's not 100 percent in the games. He's basically getting opening cutscene to ending cuts. He's, he's beating him. He's he's, yeah. he's effectively yeah. speed running him because I think it, I think the the run that he won, I think it was about 10 hours in total. So it's yeah. so it's not like he's it playing the games in yeah. in their entirety. He's doing the bare minimum. Probably glitching a bit as well. No, no, he's not glitching. He's but he's just doing the bare minimum he's to get not. through them. The, 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 the hardest one is, uh, like, for a long time, on his earlier runs, Ornstein and Smoo was his big, was his, that, that was his Achilles heel. I feel yeah. that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's never been oh, yeah. back since. I know. Just like, I know, it's coming. Just like Too Fast, Too Curious. And just let yeah. run, let yeah. run, let yeah. run, don't Why don't you do a no-hit run on Too Fast, Too Furious? <laughs> I want to I, I hit things, hit things, hit things when I watch that. <laughs> I, it's been so long, I even forgot the name of that podcast. <laughs> and I named it. In long it will come, don't worry. Mm, mm. Next. Well, moving fastly on. Um, Tokyo District Public Prosecutor's Office <laughs> arrested 57 year old game creator Yuji Naka in context of insider trading related to a new installment from the popular Dragon Quest again. franchise. Yeah, he's been naughty. Nice. <laughs> uh, he's been naughty a few years ago as well. Oh, yeah, he's a naughty boy. <laughs> he's a naughty boy, before? Yuji Naka. I mean, he made... Prostitution. <laughs> and he made Ball and Wonderworld. <laughs> <laughs> In general. <coughs> he's just a naughty boy, isn't he? He's, he's, a, he's a rebel. He's just running around and the Japanese don't like it. <laughs> Stop being a rebel. He's a... He, well, he, he just, he, I'm pretty sure he just walks around Tokyo going, fuck you, I made Sonic. <laughs> yeah. Why wouldn't you? I mean, you would. But... Yeah, yeah, he's 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 a twat, but I kind of <laughs> like him because he's a he's a lovable rogue. <laughs> do you know what I mean? He's naughty. It's, it's, he's a yeah, chaotic I mean, beast. Interesting that it's to do with the Dragon Quest franchise as well. Like, what's he got on Dragon Quest Twelve that he's been trying to get uh, money for? Mm. Exclusive puff Sonic's Sonic skins, something like that. <laughs> and I imagine in. Uh... The Japanese don't look too uh, highly on uh, Insider Trader. I imagine that's quite a severe oh, of course uh, not. charge for that. For... Yeah, no, he's uh, the Jap- in prison for that shit. The Japanese don't fuck around when it comes to white collar crime unless it's the Yakuza doing it. Yeah. Oh, they let, they allow that. <laughs> <laughs> then they encourage Carry it. On. Yep. <laughs> if, the, Carry on. if the games are anything to go by. Ooh, I, I so- just had that little lovely feeling in back of me, like, oh, I'm going to get Dragon Quest Twelve soon. <laughs> <laughs> And then we lose you for a You had a bit of a puff, 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 did you? Oh, <laughs> can't wait. That's a week off work, that. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like the Legacy of Kane series could be uh, making a comeback after 19 yes. years of the last entry. Uh, following its purchase of the venerable vampire IP in recent months, developer Crystal Dynamics polled the fans on whether or not they'd like to see a series return and what form it should return. The answer was a resounding yes. More than 100,000 people responded to the survey, and out of that, more than 70,000 completed it in its entirety. Uh, Normally, when a video game company's put these out, these questionnaires, they're lucky to get a couple of thousand respondents at best, so it's a sign that the legacy of Kane fandom is alive and well. I don't want them to do a big open world. I want them to do a story-driven, linear narrative like all the other games have been, because they're sensational. Just give me a, just, just don't want just give me a Soul Reaver remake. The biggest world. Yeah, yeah, that'll do. The biggest world we've ever created. No, no. <laughs> I don't want empty fields. <laughs> Nosgoff is a, is a planet that is dying. It is, it is post-apocalypse. There's nothing there apart from vampires and goblins and stuff. <laughs> Fucking hell, man. Don't do, don't do the Zelda thing, please. please. <laughs> anyway, next. Uh, the world of film, Kaylee Spaney, I think it is, uh, has been apparently involved in the new Alien movie at 20th Century Fox. Um, is it Fe- Fede Alvarez is directing with Scott Free producing? 
Apparently, Scott Free made it a top priority after hearing the pitch from Alvarez. And after recent scripts has been delivered, things have been picking up. Execs are going through the processes to get other cast members in. But apparently, she's been top choice for the lead role for some time. I'm not excited mm. about an alien film. I would be Need happy to, more, to be I proved think. wrong, but I'm not excited. Mm-hmm. Not just after the mess that was people, covered. Just don't make people really stupid. Yeah. Have at least a few on the soft. Have at least a few competent people on this a scientific vessel or whatever it is. You'd expect <laughs> some of those people to actually be sensible and competent, wouldn't you? But every the last Come two on, guys, films, you can check your helmet off here. The last two films have all just been absolute morons. Maybe that the first person killed be the, the the moron. They're the cautionary tale. Then everyone else actually sorts their shit out. Exactly. Yeah, he'll be the Scottish engineer, won't he? No. Like what were you, Biggie? An R really an RPG. A moron. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be whatever your character was. Yeah. <laughs> My name I'll is Biggie. I'll just look over here for something. The moron. Yeah. Oh, there's an alien chair for us, but I'm just going to go try and steal some money in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you had that coming. It was on you. his card. <laughs> You went into the shower room. No one goes into the shower rooms on alien films because that's where you get killed. <laughs> <laughs> Idiot. Ugh. Next. Uh, Stranger Things stand out. Joseph Quinn is in the midst of a deal to join Lupita Nyong'o's. Um, lost my space, sorry. Uh, I've never heard of that. Stranger Things standout Joseph Quinn is in the midst of a deal to join Lupita Nyong'o in A Quiet Place Day One. I still can't pronounce her name right. <laughs> Do you get her name wrong twice? I'm you not cutting the first one out now. The first, <laughs> you got the first one closer to the second one. Ungoyo, isn't it? That's how you say it. Ungoyo. Anyway, yeah. little is known about the new movie, apart from the fact that it'll be set in the same universe as the other Quiet Place movies. But follows oh, different characters in shit. different locations. It's day one in it. It's about people dealing with do. I know we got you get a little bit of that at the start of Quiet Place too, but I think it's going to be yeah, a more proper day one, a proper day one thing. I didn't like the second one. The first one was brilliant. I think mm. until you thought about it, and apparently until you, until you think about it, until you think about it, all just of... falls to bits completely. Uh, the whole thing. Mm-hmm. You can't At time dash sneeze at middle of night. <laughs> yeah, you can't make a single noise, but somehow, somehow, uh, a newspaper you have to company managed, managed to be able you managed can... to be able to print those newspapers and distribute them around the country. <laughs> <laughs> and a newborn baby was quiet. Yeah. <laughs> Enough. I'm not too quiet. Oh. Director of uh, Nicholas Cage's The Pigs. Um, is Michael Sonofsky is apparently in the director's chair. Pigs. What did he say? <laughs> the wink, pigs. Wink, wink. It's just called pig. called pig. The pigs, he said. I'm the sure pigs. he said the pigs. the pigs. It's the sequel. It's just called Pig. The pig. Next. <laughs> he's, put, he's moving himself along now. Yeah. <laughs> the pigs. Uh, apparently Indy Jones 5 will pit Indy against the Nazis again uh, in 1969. Exclusively revealed by friends of the show Empire Magazine, Empire can reveal that Indiana Jones 5 finds our hero in 1969 living against the backdrop of the space race. But the American effort With to Nazis. beat the Russians to the moon <laughs> bring Still it to Nazis around, truth man. for Indy. Not like, not like Indiana Jones, Jones Nazis. Not, not, the other ones who will ask all the right, questions. Yeah, not but them kind of Nazis. They didn't just disappear in like... Just skinheads. <laughs> just fucking skinheads in Argentina. The, s- the simple fact is that the moon landing program was run by a bunch of ex-Nazis. Ooh. Fuck. Hang on, is, is it... One, no. Two, isn't this the plot line to uh, Wolfenstein? Yeah. <laughs> Wolfenstein, the new order. Where, has where you Hitler lives on Venus. Fine. It's, it's, it's an alternate universe. This fucking curses and aliens and shit. And, and, they're they're not aliens, aliens, they're extra-dimensional beings. You know what I mean? You know well, yeah, but... Um, <laughs> it's just, it's just, not a real world. Just go with it. I know. Yeah. It's just... He's going to fight Hitler in a mechanized I'm not, fridge. I'm, I'm not against watching Hopefully. Harrison Ford punch Nazis. <laughs> I'm all for the Nazi punching. It's just Nazis on the moon. It's just great. Is it going to be one of those things though, where it's just, it's just like German scientists living in America and they've got the German accents and then they move their lapels and they've got a swastika underneath it or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> oh, you were a Nazi all along. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Oh, on, on his arm, he's got a swastika tattoo. Like, oh no, he has found us. <laughs> Van, run away! 
There'll be one. Well, there'll well, be one that's really sinister throughout, and actually turns out he's the good guy. He's the red herring for the audience. Yeah, he's not even a Nazi. He's not even a Nazi. He's just Hans from Austria. <laughs> yeah, he's just Hans. That's all. Yeah. Going when no man has gone before. Oh fuck off! Oh, get him off! <laughs> Oh, get him off! Get him off! <laughs> Put him in the sin bin or something like that. Fucking hell! <laughs> and for those that need to know, the budget for Fast Ten has ballooned to three hundred and forty million dollars. What the fuck are they going to spend all that money on? Well, isn't that because they had to <laughs> stop for the stop for three months when um, you, you fucking pissed off the director? <sighs> mm. They have spent a lot on on Corona and. Um... It's the matter Chicken as they go through, though, no, isn't it, as well? There's no way that they don't get corona for free now. <laughs> yeah, that's prob- yeah, that's probably true, mate. That's probably true. Mm, I'm, I'm, I'm always up for a new Fast and Furious film. Great franchise. Day Fantastic one, you two. Franchise. Want you two in there, day one. Instant reaction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can't just like he's dying a little bit when I said that. <laughs> yeah, he's dying inside. <laughs> Speaking of incredible franchises, Amazon has now announced it's reviving Australian TV soap Neighbours less than four months what? after its much publicised final episode. The show will resume filming next year and will then be available in the UK and US on Amazon Freebie. What a great noise that is. The company's <laughs> free streaming service. <laughs> Freebie? What's that? <laughs> I don't know, but... <laughs> I think Bezos was just a big Neighbours fan. He was just like, do you know what? I've got the fucking money. Let's just, I'll buy it. Like, what happened on the final the episode of the Neighbours? Years. Did it turn into like Mad Max on last episode or something like that? No, it ended with Kylie good. Minogue and Jason Donovan. Um, Did it? Come yeah, back. But they didn't say anything. It was really oh. weird. Just, I, yeah, kind of, just I, I didn't from, watch the episode, I just watched a clip of it. They just walk from yeah, house to house, wedding. like just hugging the people that still live there. And then Especially yeah. for and, you. And she does We're like that. She used to, so she used to crawl in and out of her bedroom window to go out and sneak out and see him, and so she crawls back. Get fingered by him, yeah, I remember. <laughs> yeah, and they go and like, <laughs> crawl back through the window. She shouldn't live there anymore, but she just decided to crawl back through the window. Get out! <laughs> but she didn't say anything. It was really odd. I think, yeah, I, was, I, think uh, I think it wasn't the whole conceit that Ramsey Street was being sold to developers or something like that, and they were going to like <laughs> knock it anymore, knock it all down. So they all had to fuck off. <laughs> So oh, it turns out when it gets revived, Amazon like Harold Bishop's just going to wake up and he's like, oh, "It was all just a dream." <laughs> I was going to get out of shower like Dallas, Mudge, Mudge, or homeless. Get out of shower. It's going to be a CGI version of him to, to de-age him. Oh, we're back in the eighties. Oh, that'd be cool if they, if they did that. Made it a like a, a an eighties version or a nineties version. That'd be even better. That'd be worth yeah, watching. I don't, I don't like seeing Todd with the. Uh, Grey in his hair makes me feel oh, no, old. No, makes me feel no, old. No, no, no <laughs> ponytail coming out. You used to have uh, a little ponytail, didn't it? Yeah. It was, it, yeah. yeah. Does he does he still have the goatee? The little kind oh yeah yeah he's got a sex goatee. pest goatee. Yeah, yeah. he's quite fancy him. You've ruined it with the sex pest wow. bit now. There's a, I, I know didn't what? ruin it. He ruined it by looking like one. I I he's got the goatee <laughs> for her pleasure. <laughs> I, I don't watch the show. I've, I've not watched it since like two thousand. Oh, I am to a child. Yeah, I haven't seen it for years. But I from randomly came across, you know, when you're just scrolling through like YouTube shots. It was like a clip of him, like, and he's where his wife was dying on the beach. It was proper sad. <laughs> Fucking hell! It was like, oh, no. it was it was a really oh, no. it was a really good moment. Like he he, he acted it really well. I was surprised. I feel, I feel sorry for these like these it's been <laughs> these in it years. Actors. It must have been in about thirty yeah, years. Yeah, they've just done one job, like him and like Ian Beale from EastEnders. Have literally done one job for thirty five years. The same yeah, character. Steady paycheck, and, though, isn't it? But, but oh yeah, no. But they'll still, they'll still go around and go. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm an actor. I'm a professional actor. I'm like, you've done one role all your life. <laughs> is that even great. a role anymore? Man's, is it just people you? Think you are Ian Beale. Man's yeah, getting paid. Exactly. Yeah, it's a job. He it? gets more than us. Oh, next, please. I knew we get Speaking so much out of more than us. fucking nibs. <laughs> Fans. Quentin Tarantino has confirmed his next project will be an eight-episode limited series. Filming begins next year. When I don't think he's TV. done TV yet, has he? No. He's Money done, is in TV. He's just he delaying that last project. I was going to say, is that, is that so he can extend his career by another couple of years? <laughs> yeah, because he kept saying, oh, I'm going to do one more film and that's it. Ten films in it or something he wanted to do. Yeah, he wanted to do ten in films. Total. Even though he's technically mm-hmm. done more. Like, more. He's already done ten. He's, but he doesn't include he doesn't in, yeah. include death proof. His last film was a masterpiece though. Yeah, it was. was it. 
I, I, I think I love all his films, to be fair. I want the, sp- I want the sci-fi one. Talked about doing sci-fi at some point. Yeah, he did. He wanted to do Star Trek for years as well, because he's a massive Star Trek fan. Yeah, give me a, give me a Tarantino sci-fi. He's, he's obsessed with um, he's touched original so many, series. Yeah, no, he's touched so many other, like, genres that's one where he hasn't gone yet i don't think he can do sci-fi i mean if, if he's if he's doing if he's doing sci-fi you know other, other worlds other things how is he going to shove the n-word in there oh, we'll find a way we'll find a way <laughs> yeah of course you will you'll find It'll a way the US could be a planet. n-word just think just <laughs> think of all just, just think of all those like alien feet yeah on space well. trotters <laughs> space oh, trotters oh yeah <laughs> close up with a bit of lens flare on toenails oh. Yard. Beautiful. Speaking of which, the Weird World Web has provided a couple of stories. So Mariah Carey's nice. application to trademark the moniker of Queen of Christmas has been denied by the US God. Patent and Trademark Office. American <laughs> she is not a sovereign. Was rejected after her company did not respond to another singer's opposition. The trademark would have given her the legal right to stop others from using the title on music and merchandise. He also failed in attempts to trademark the abbreviation QOC and Princess <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> didn't Did she they, um, like? Didn't she at one point like want to disown the whole like people yeah. playing that song? And yeah, then she realised yeah. I'm gonna I'll lean into it because I actually can make more money out of it. And actually, I haven't created any music in ten years. <laughs> it was like, I think I think it was when she it was in the nineties when she was still trying to be an artist. Yeah, and it wasn't until like the mid two thousands. She's like, "Oh fuck it, I'm going to lean into this. This is, this is I'm dining out on this for life." He might and I'm well. sorry, Michael Bublé is the Queen of Christmas. Everyone knows, <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows that. Oh God, it's nearly December. They're going to be wheeling holiday, him out of his cupboard. Jolly Christmas. He'll be out of cave right now. He'll hear the cry oh, yeah. of the wild. He feels the first cold snap on his on his chest. It is time <laughs> to break out the piano. Break out the <laughs> Bublé. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Oodles has finally been proven right. An elderly man has sadly been airlifted and taken to hospital with a serious injury after being attacked and trampled by a dangerously out of control cow. Told up. Police have said officials say the animal was humanely dispatched after running into a field. Sorry, I don't know what I'm cow gunned. That. You got cow gunned, didn't it? That last <laughs> sentence, Piggy. That's awful. What cow? You're fucking done in. Piggy's Fuck gone. The cow. <laughs> Okay. Horrible beast. I love that. Yeah, he's got back at head. No country for old men. Stung. <laughs> <laughs> done. Absolutely done. And then rushed off to Mackey D's. <laughs> Looks like meat's back on the menu, boys. <laughs> 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 Fuck them. Horrible beasts. Oh, we work, I work with animals. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Oh, biggie. Oh, God. <laughs> Oh, you're a terrorist. Before we move on, Biggie, what are you are you like strapped into your room there? What's going on behind you? Yeah, I was wondering that. <laughs> are you trying to stop your wife and kid like trying to come through the door? Like, yeah, he's put a trap on. He's like home alone. <laughs> are you scared of the sticky bandits are gonna turn up? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> for, for the listener's benefit, <laughs> he's, he's he's got a bungee cord going from the door handle to his cupboard. <laughs> and a bucket on top of door frame. Yeah. So when the cover well, lands uh, on their head, <laughs> is it heated up as well? Asphyxiation after the yeah. pod's finished. <laughs> it's battery acid. <laughs> That's what the candles in there for, is it as well? Just <laughs> yeah. Oh, I remember the other day when he got that candle out. He's got it so there. Funny. There it is. <laughs> oh, he's got his candle out. Look. <laughs> Fucking hell. Midnight mass. <laughs> well, I wonder what else is in that room? Midnight I'm masturbation. <laughs> Midnight masturbation. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, no. Oh, wow. <laughs> Carry on. That's it, right? Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. Let's move on to the Nexus before this terrible podcast implodes upon itself. Uh, Candy, what you've been doing? I ain't seen you for ages, mate. Yeah, well, I've had a bit of a biggie of a week, but I do just want it because I've been doing the two things we talked about last week, which is. Have you been, set, have you been setting traps in, in your house and stuff like that? Like no, and has, I don't have any oh, like wait. French ticklers or anything hanging up in my cupboard, which I'm a bit worried Biggie might have. <laughs> <laughs> of course he has. <laughs> Can confirm. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, I just wanted to say my uh, little bit about God of War just very quickly. And um, like Stig, it is. I thought it's a ve- very much a direct sequel to God of War 2018. I think you would definitely have to play the last game. Um, I, n- I noticed, I thought there was a bit of a step up in difficulty with the puzzles. 
Like it seems a lot less obvious to to know what to do to actually solve the puzzles. But at the same time, mm. it's annoying how quickly your companion will tell you what to do. That is starting to piss me off now. Yeah. I'm in like chapter five, and it's just like I'll I'll get into a room, I'll look around, and I'm, I'm I'm getting the bits of the puzzle in my head to work out what to do. And then Atreus will go, oh, look at that over there, Dad. I'm like, fuck yeah. off, you little shit. <laughs> yeah, it does do that. I had that with my mate the other day. It was like, why don't you try doing this on the lift, brother? And I was like, I'm literally walking towards that now. I've seen what to do. I know where I'm going. Shut up. <laughs> well, I like to take a moment to just like take in the awe of the scenery as well. Yeah. And if they're just rabbiting on in your ear, oh, you need to shoot that. Well, fuck off. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I loved, I, I loved it. I, I do like that there's very little um, HUD as well. It just feels so much more immersive. And the game just feels mm. really alive. Like everywhere you turn, there's butterflies and little rats and things. It's cool. Um, but just um, like Gadget, I haven't blasted my way straight through the main story. I've been just picking up and doing the side quests. Um, so I'm not that I've, far into I've platinum and it. I've platinumed it already. I know. But it's didn't you monster. play it on hard it's mode as monster. well? <laughs> yeah, on hardest mode. Oh, that's insane. <laughs> I've got it to the second to easiest mode. I can't turn it down. Normal. I can't turn the, 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 the settings down because there's a glitch. So I can't even make it easy for me. I was struggling there and proper struggling. But, I yeah, think I'm on... He's... It's all right, like chapter okay. four. I've just finished chapter four. They're rookie numbers. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, no, I'm really enjoying it so far. I've, had, I've done other stuff this week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, um, I watched The Crown as well, The Fictitious Crown, and it's just been my comfort food. I went, I went back and um, started the series from the beginning again. Isn't it so good? Oh my God. Yeah, absolutely. It's a complete fictitious story, as we all know. <laughs> it's such a good. I don't know how the 40. Oh. I don't know. Well, how I just feel sorry for the queen because she's not, she's not going to know how it ends now. Wow, the fictitious queen. <laughs> the fictitious did you, queen. Did you stand up and mm-hmm. sing "God Save the Queen" after every episode, Candy? Of course, I'd, I had my. You high love tea. a bit of Queenie, don't you? You love her. Oh, I do. I love the queen. Oh, you love bless her. her. God rest her soul. I wonder where they're no. going to end it. By her dying, probably. No, do you reckon they'll go Why that am I far? Laughing? <laughs> well, are they really going like, to go into Prince Andrew and? I fucking love they've, they've already skimmed I over watch that. that series. No, they've already they're... skimmed over the Prince Andrew stuff. It's no, gone. no, no. We can't have it. Only happened like two. No, two years. The, the, but he, the, the things that he was doing was. Oh yeah, but the rev- then... rev- revelations to the general public. Oh, maybe like, they'll, maybe they'll talk about it when it actually comes out. You know? I think it'll. He's end. a slime ball in that program, though. Yeah, oh, the whole episode ball. of the queue. <laughs> Just everyone stood waiting. <laughs> I'm into it. I'm into it. They could end on the platy jubes, couldn't they? Just have the queen on the balcony, just like, just do a brief nod to herself, like, yes, this has been my life, and then just walks off into the distance, it's holding just, hands with Paddington I, Bear. Off the balcony! Oh <laughs> <laughs> it's just really good. It's just a really good show. You don't even have to be into the fictitious royal family. It's just a great drama. It's fantastic. Mm. Love it. Love it. Is that you done, mate? That's me done. Loser. <laughs> uh, Stig, you've been doing, mate. Uh, this week I watched another superhero film by the name of Black Adam. Ooh. Ooh. Oh. Oh. So, if a film could be described as having the stench of the Snyderverse all over it, <laughs> it would be oh, this no. film. It's pro face script, the color grading, the lighting, the slow motion, the music. If if someone if I didn't know who the director of this film was and someone told me it was Zack Snyder, I'd have believed you. Like it is clear that uh John Colette Serra has taken his inspiration for his first superhero outing from Zack Snyder's films. And because Zack Snyder's Justice League's good. Because so. there's so much yeah, but Man of Steel and Batman vs. Superman aren't. No, but not. There's so much about the way it looks. It just comes from that kind of school of directing. I did think that when mm. I first saw the, saw the trailer that it had like not necessarily the look of a Snyder, of of the Snyderverse, but it like it had the colours of it. Like, yeah, it had that know, kind of washed out greys with the pops of colour in it. You know, like the the weird kind of way that Three Hundred looks when it does, yep. like, like a sepia tone. Yeah, but then like the kind of. Everyone seems to pop a lot where the backgrounds are a bit like yeah they've know, all got like outlines aren't they yeah like there's there's like flashback scenes to you know when Black Adam was a slave and and where he comes from and all that like there's, there's 
there's flashback scenes like that, and it just looked really weird. Um, that's all I could get could get out of my head was just like this looks like a Zack Snyder film. I just think that to its detriment because you're not doing your own thing. Anyway, for about two thirds of this film, however, I was actually kind of enjoying it. I actually did kind of like the way that Black Adam was really ruthless and how it kind of painted him in that light to start with. Like he comes out and he's literally the first thing he does is he grabs a man by the head and just melts the guy's body. And you see it all. You see like his whole body just like getting electrified and turned to a skull. And like he, he comes out, he doesn't give a shit. He's not a good guy. He's not a bad guy because he kind of helps the good guys. He, he, he's just get in my way and I'll fuck you up kind of person. Perfectly fine. Um, but he does progress to be more of a hero, even though throughout the whole thing he likes to tell everyone, I'm not a hero. Why? I'm not he a, hero. a hero. He he says, I'm not a hero over and over again. He is a bit of a raggy bastard. So he, he's, he's, he's just, just a baddie. He is, he's supposed to be he a baddie. A, he is an anti hero in this. He does help the good guys against what is essentially a military ruled uh, Kandar. Is it Kandar? Kandar. Yeah. Yeah. So no, no, Kandahar is the real place. Yeah, Kandahar is the yeah, it's made up place. Isn't okay. it? Yeah. yeah. So he, he helps the good guys kind of liberate them from the military rule by but doing it in a bad way. You know, he, he um, yep. I just want them to go if they're going to carry it on, which they will do because the money it's made and and what's come out after it. It just you have to go down the villain route with him. You have to take him down the villain route at some point. You can't keep him as an anti-hero. As much as The Rock probably wants to keep him as an anti-hero because, heaven forbid, The Rock would be a bad guy, even though he's played a bad guy a lot before. Mm. Um, you, you've got to go in that direction with it. There's no way you can. Um, but there are I moments... It... Go on, sorry. Carry on. Well, the reason is that he didn't want to introduce this character as a Shazam bad guy. He wanted it, it to have... Yeah, but he wanted it to have a proper <laughs> backstory and his own film and a kind of a arc into it, rather than just becoming, rather than just being a bad guy. He wanted to show people where that happens and how that happens, and there are things in this film that hint towards that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it did have its moments. It made me laugh a few times. There's a moment with the Rock where to do around with catchphrases and stuff that really made me laugh. Actually, uh, Pierce Brosnan looks amazing in it. He just He's just kind of... He's Dr. Fate. He's Dr. Fate, yeah, and he's just, he looks great in it. He sounds he great. He looks like him anyway. I think he does look like him. Yeah, I really enjoyed Aldous Hodge's Hawkman as well. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he, he puts up a good fight against Black Adam because they have this team of the, the Justice Society. Society. Yeah. And it also includes Atom Smasher and Cyclone, who yeah. might as well not have even been in the film for all their good Or in the are. books. Yeah, honestly... <laughs> You take them out of this film, it's exactly the same film. They're just making up numbers. It's a bit stupid, really. To make it an actual justice society, you need yeah. more than three people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it just they just don't do anything. Why didn't they put Hawk Girl in there instead? Was she supposed Hawk, to be? Hawk Man, I guess. I don't know. Mm, <laughs> anyway, like I said, there was a few funny moments. I did laugh. Um, I just there was you know some dry comedy in there, which was was quite good. But I didn't think they played with the person out of time concept enough remember like he's been asleep for five thousand years they didn't play on that they should have played on that a little bit more for laughs and for you know confusion that that should have been kind of a, a funny thing with it uh the film though it massively loses its way in the final third like it just it's become some big rush to get to the finish it's really crap it looks really crap i appreciate them going comic accurate with a bad guy but it's so fucking goofy that it doesn't fit the tone of the film whatsoever. If it had been in Shazam, it would have worked completely fine. But it just didn't seem to work with Black Adam at all, considering what we'd had before. And um, so yeah, like The Rock is really just kind of <clears throat> I don't know. He's trying to be so serious and like I said, poor is, face. is he like it, what he's like in in the Scorpion King? I can't remember what it's like in that. Oh, he's probably. so serious in that. He barely he's, talks. He, he's he is just too serious in this, and he does try and crack a few jokes, and not all of them land. But yeah, I tend to, I'm tending to agree with the critics who have this at around forty percent on Rotten Tomatoes. It's just the, ma- the 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 final third of the film is just completely let down, and the script is just shocking in places. There is a side story with involving a woman and her kid and her brother who 
originally find this crown or something that's got demons in it. Um, no one's ever found this crown before, but apparently they just walk into a temple and it's there. It's, it's just really, they are. yeah, it's just yeah, but just the way they walk in, it's, it's really stupid. It's a really shit setup, um, and it's all this story about the local people rising up and you know f- needing a hero and stuff. And it, but the, just the dialogue around all that. And the way it's done is just really shit. Uh, so yeah, uh, I, I find it super baffling, and I know I'm gonna. It's so baffling why they made a film on Black Adam. It just <laughs> makes no sense. He's not. A, it's think of it this way: it's like Marvel doing a full standalone film of. Ooh, let me think. Someone that low down. The Tinkerer. They are doing a Marvel, though, aren't they? they they've no, tried to have success with the big characters, and then they're looking at other characters they can make a movies out of. Yeah, but every exactly Marvel, Marvel film that's based on its, a single character has been a massive character. You might not think they are, because you, if, if you didn't read the books, but even Ant-Man, Ant-Man was probably lowest have gone down, but even Ant-Man's still a massive character with massive arcs. Black Adam's Black Adam. He just, he's just a palette swap of Shazam. He's just a bad version of Shazam, isn't he? Yeah, there's nothing else to it. It's fucking weird, but well, Rock the, 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 there are moments so. in this where it kind of is pushing you out to where it's going to go, and just watch the pitch meetings of this. It's perfect. I've seen the end credits because it got spoiled to me as well. Yeah, so can we talk about the end credits? <laughs> who who hasn't seen? What happens in the end credits or hasn't been privy to what happened. Not bothered. Okay. Not bothered. Not bothered, not bothered, not heard, heard, right. If you don't want to know what happens, just skip along a minute or so. So you the end credits. It. The end credits got spoiled by not only the internet, but the actual fucking film team around the yep. film <laughs> won't shut up talking about it. Which is really annoying because for all that I could have been really a good moment. Snyder's films, Superman, yep. Henry Cavill turning up in the credit scene. I'd have been like, wow, fucking hell, that, that, that would get me excited to see what It's a big moment, next. isn't it? Yeah. And it's, it is a big moment in the fact that we're going to go somewhere with it. Um, and it, I think this is where it's going to lead towards Black Adam being a bad guy. I like how they think that Black Adam can stand up to Superman in any way, shape, or form. He's hilarious. He's a ah, fucking god. He's a god. <laughs> well, Black Adam's kind of a... He's got wizard powers, hasn't he? Yeah, magic powers, they and can, that is they, super. That is Superman's weakness, magic. Actually, yeah, they can just mess around with yeah, it, can't they? I suppose they could. Was not uh, supposed I mean, to be I've the gag. Seen, was, like, was that supposed to be the gag for Shazam? Wasn't it? Wasn't everyone expecting Henry Cavill to appear in the second Shazam film? Yes, because he, he well, Superman yeah. shit all the way through it. His mate. No, well, he appears in the in the end, doesn't he? Yeah, he, 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 he Superman, well, Superman his appears right at the end, but without yeah, his right head. Yeah. So they all. They're all in that in that world, and there are some kind of fun jokes around the kid who idolizes a super, Superman and Batman and Aquaman mm. in that. And there's yeah. there is a there is actually a really good moment where the Justice Society are called out, saying mm-hmm. you like we've been under oppressive rule for years, and you've done fuck all about it. And it wasn't until he showed up and did something about it that he actually took notice. There's a real yeah. good like kind of social commentary on that uh, about how. They'll care about, the, the, does they'll it care have about people Cohen over here. singing hallelujah in the background. Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but there is quite a good bit of social commentary around that. It's just that the film is just pants. So I don't <laughs> want to carry on talking about it anymore because it's not very good. Excellent. You done any more? I have, but I'll talk about it in the green room. <laughs> Black Adam's going on the pot out. <laughs> um, I'll go next. I've started a new game because, yes, I've done God of War. Tactics Ogre Reborn. Does anyone know what that is? I've, you've shown yes. me screenshots. I've seen screenshots. I'm already out. Oh, fuck <laughs> off, mate. Fuck off. It's a tactical role-playing game depicting the struggle for control of the Valerian Isles. We've heard that kind of thing before, haven't we? Hmm. So think of it as yeah, it's just a tactical game. You've, you've seen what ta- it's chess, kinda. But this one's very Dungeons and Dragons. This this game. I said that to uh, Gadget the other day, and it's got even more Dungeons and Dragons. The more I've gone into it, mate. It's on my Steam like, list. Like all the rule sets are very similar to what we do when we're playing that. Like 
unlike games What's like the actual ones, um, then? You no, know, the, 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 the invisible dice rolls in the background. Anyway, um, I think you can turn them on so you can actually see the dice rolls, but I, I leave them off because I always roll well. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it, it does like the battle maps are more like when Gadget has designed a map to us. It's designed for that encounter. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's, 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 there's no random battles in this. At They're all. all crafted battles. They're all proper crafted. Like a DM's just sat there and gone, right, here we go. It's going to be perfect. Like th- there might be two towers where you can put your snipers on. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Um, and all, all, all the like, Classes, are, they're not called D and D classes. They're called different classes, but you yeah. know what they are. You know what I mean? You, you can tell it's them, and the, because it's not a Final Fantasy game, even though it looks like a Final Fantasy game, and it's made by the same people, it's not got that Final Fantasy rule set that all those games have. Right, so it does okay. its own thing. Like it's got a lot of emphasis on, yeah, you can do a lightning attack on, on a baddie, but why not utilize that? And put that lightning onto someone else, one of your party members, so their attacks, their sword swipes, has lightning attached to it as well. So it's that: do I do this? Do I stay back? There's a lot of positioning involved in this, which a lot of these tactical games don't do. It's just beat the leader in it, and a lot of them win. That's yeah. usually the, the. But what you do, every 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 turn, every turn action you have, yeah. Like a random little blue tarot card will pop up on the map, and if you pick that up, it, it changes the tide of battle, like the deck of many things. Ooh. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's just it's just so, like, like Final Fantasy Tactics and uh, those type of games, Into the Breach, those type of games, they're very simplistic, aren't they? And the, and the, the mastered their, their it, simplicity. It, it, yeah, yeah, the simplicity is what they do especially well. Yeah, yeah. With this, it, it, it's just the opposite way around, like with Dungeons and Dragons, there's so many rules, isn't there? Yes, but big, it's, big, the, booming the, the, and complicated. The, yeah, but these rules are, are meant to make the game more pleasurable and more dynamic. So you can't get bored of battles, if you get me. And it's got a beautiful, sensational, like, quality of life thing where it's got the, it's called a tarot wheel, where if you really made a mistake so bad, you can rewind time. All right. And you can only, you can only do that a certain amount of times on a, on a match. And it just, it makes it so, you, you can take risks, you know, like we would in uh, Scotch Sheep, we yeah. take a risk, but we can't rewind time, can we? You've mm. got to live with those actions. So then you've got to decide, do you want to waste that on there? Because it could get worse later down the line, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's just very good. And you, every, every, like, between battles and stuff, when you're chatting and stuff, it's all voice acted, sensationally. Proper Shakespearean and ye old English, really nice. And every... Nearly every cutscene you're talking in, you've got to make a decision, and it changes the story completely. And it's it's just it's really good. Just please just give it a try if if you're into that what I've just described. And pixel art, so obviously the the, the graphics are the little sixteen bits, aren't they? Little yeah, I, I do I do want to give it a try. I, I think it looks yeah. Good. It's definitely it's definitely something for you, mate. You you you'll see it because the actual menu is a spreadsheet. So. Nice. Yes, exactly. It's just really good. Um, it is actually a remake of the 1995 game on the SNES. Um, like a reskin rather than a remake, and all quality of life stuff been put onto it. It's just really good. But on the original, it did have random battles, and they've took them off. If you want to grind, you can just go to the training camp and fight random monsters, you know what I mean, when you want. But the game's scaled better now, so the stronger you get, the stronger the enemies get, that kind of thing. Yeah. It's just it's just, oh, it's just super good, man. Uh, if you like politics, if you like Dungeons & Dragons, get it played. Tactics over, reborn. That's mine. Obviously, I did God of War as well, finish that. Easy, mate. <laughs> 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 Completing it, mate. But yeah, um, who haven't I asked? Me. Me. You. You. Take your pick, one of you two. Who wants to go next? I'll give it to you. You decide. Go on then, Biggie. No, oh, he's decided for you. It's not a biggie one. Um, so I completed the COD campaign on Veteran. Uh, that was fun-ish. Baller. Uh, it was hard going, but I uh, did it. So I had is that, that. Is that like where you little... get shot once and you're fucking dead? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. I'd never get past oh, first yes. level, me. 
<laughs> yeah, it's uh, tough going at times, but uh, kind of enjoyed it in its own little way. Um, and yeah, it's a pretty cool campaign, as I mentioned before. Uh, jumped into the new Warzone 2.0. Um, oh yeah, played that's pretty cool. Um, like that. There's a few. Is that the drop-in there, one? Yeah. Where you drop yeah, in yeah. that one? I'd like the DMZ. Is it DMZ mode where you do like missions? Yeah, I haven't done that bit yet. That's miles more enjoyable. Is that demilitarized than... zone? Is that what that's supposed to yeah, be? Yeah, it's so much better than Battle Royale in my <coughs> opinion. Because you actually have like little tasks to do, and you've got mm. there's also some bots running around that like get in your way. So you take them out, and then you'll get um, like other teams are given like I think they're given like a contract to hunt you. So you've got like. Get, it's a bit more get, engaging. Yeah, and you can pick shit up while you go. So you, you'll pick stuff up, like maybe you'll pick some gold up or some documents, and you, you end up earning a bit of money. It's like, shit, right, we're all sat here with like 15 grand on us. Right, let's get ourselves to an extraction point. And you, then you've got to work your way out to get to an extraction that sounds point. Like, um, sounds like, um, what's that Ubisoft game? Um, Division. When you go in the dark zone. Sounds like that. Yeah, it does. Know. Know, but yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, no, yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 I've... Sorry, big I'm taking over here, but I've been playing no, that, no, no, no. And, and it's like I just find big that God more. Kid. I just find it more enjoyable than dropping in and the map shrinking and and getting shot, getting shot. And oh shit! All right, I'm out. <laughs> I'm out the match now. Great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not fun. That yeah, when you can work well together with your mates, it's much more fun. Definitely. Mm. Got get nature. I uh, also still like this one. I finally got my daughter to sit through the whole of my neighbor Totoro, Ooh. and she loved it. She really enjoyed it. Good. Good. And, uh, yeah, I'm hopefully going to get her to watch some more uh, Studio Ghibli stuff. So I'm really happy with that. I also managed to get her to watch the start to watch the original Thundercats. Nice. Why? <laughs> because it's a classic. I told her I watched it when I was a kid, and she was fully invested. And, and she didn't believe it. you. Did you point out how much you fancy <laughs> Chitara? Yeah, did you? Not yet. <laughs> Although the interesting... Did you say, we were going to call you Snaff as well, but your mother wouldn't allow it. Snaff, Snaff. Fucking Snaff. That first episode, Exodus, is really weird because they're running around for half of it naked until they get yep. armour. So it's really, it's really weird. Yeah. And a bit yeah, uncomfortable with a, a young lino running around with nothing on. But uh, the only other main thing that I've... You don't have a penis, <laughs> so it's all right. <laughs> The only other main thing I've done this week is I recorded a pod with Mr. Plant and John. What? And I did a, an episode of 100 Things We Learned From Film. And yes, I covered Ice Pirates, which oh, they hated me for. I, have, I, knew, <laughs> I knew before you even recorded this that he was, he was fuming. <laughs> terrible, so yeah, mate. check that out once uh, they've got it put it all together and put it out. But yeah, I had a lot of fun. Oh, uh, plant I'm shilling for him. And he has to listen to some shit because he does he does the off weeks on a uh, Hallmark of Greatness, doesn't he? Where they watch like the shit films that Hallmark actors. Hey, are being he puts in. he's putting himself through it. So <laughs> it's his own fault. Yeah, imagine imagine having to like sit through he films you don't twice. like for content for your podcast network, and some people just don't want to do that, do they? No, yeah. the stick. Well, people just don't want to do it. So oh, imagine right, having yeah. yeah 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 picking up yeah. picking up. Picking up <laughs> I got yeah I got there I got there I got there you got that boy yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're so fast, mate. Yeah. And it's like furious. It's like we're all family. <laughs> Got that family connection. You'd think so. Yeah, yeah, Panty yeah, always, Panty always watches it twice. Week. He watches it once, and then he watches it again to make notes. Wow. He doesn't just watch it, watch it once and then come on and start chatting shit about it. No, I, when I did, when I did it mine, I, I watched it once and made notes. As, I wrote notes as I was going through it, and I made, like, look this up. Do you know what I mean? Like, rather, you know, it's like just, yeah, yeah. Right, look that up, look mm. that up, look that up. Very nice. Yeah, that's my Very week. Nice. Busy week. Big to you, Biggie number two. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> so, despite the disrespect in this house, um, this week I went. I went outside. I went to the cinema. Shockingly enough, fair enough for me to go outside Gross. these days. Uh, but last night, Pip and I went to see the menu. Oh yes. Oh, I've heard good things Ooh. about this. It's really fucking good. It looks um, good from the trailer. Yeah, so the menu's a, it's it's a it's a black comedy thriller, which is kind of three genres that don't tend to go that well together, generally speaking. Um it stars Ray Fiennes, Anya Taylor Joy, and Nicholas Holt, amongst um a few others. And it tells the story of um a a couple, one of them who is an, an extreme foodie, 
um, who go to a secluded island where a celebrity chef has his most pomp- pompous restaurant uh, and where they eat the most delectable food on a tasting menu that he's put together. And then there's a turn and shit gets really fucking dark. Um, it's really good. It is really funny. The dialogue is... It's not laugh out loud funny, but it's like you'll be chuckling throughout the whole thing because it is very witty. It's very put together. Um, people manage to kind of put their foot in it because it's, it, it's again, it's one of these places. It's the height of snobbery, this restaurant that they're going to. Um, uh, what's his name? Julian Slovic is um, Ray Fiennes' character. Um, and he is like he, all of his chefs that work with him in the kitchen. It's almost like a cult. Like he comes out with each course and he kind of claps his hands together and everyone stands to attention and he describes the dish. And then he comes out and it's like it's a fucking single scallop on a rock. It's meant to represent <laughs> the ocean or some shit like that. You know, it's that kind of taking the piss out of foodies. Um, there are um, a few characters there that are, um, uh, they're like your typical kind of finance bros who think they know everything and they're, they're trying to like ask for substitutions and changes and the, um, the head waitress is just shutting them down completely. But like I say, so you get all this stuff, which is quite funny. And then, like I say, it gets to a turn and it gets really fucking dark in the best way possible because when it starts to get dark, the tension starts to ramp up and it stops. It's it's less of a black comedy from that point and then it's more of the thriller side of things. Um, it, it, it borders on to like proper psychological shit as it gets further into the film. Um, and I really enjoyed it. I didn't expect much from it. Like I'd seen the trailers, thought, oh, this will be good because I like everyone who's in it and yeah. um, it looks pretty and it's well put. Cinematography is incredible. Like when they first get to the island, um, there's a lot of shots along, kind of along the beaches of, of the kind of the, um, the kind of ecology that's there and it's beautiful and the food shots are beautifully done as well. Like every course comes out and you get it as if it is written on a menu, like what the course is and what's involved with it. And then that kind of then blends into the humor or some of the dark shit later on. Um, it's it's where's really, the location really, supposed to be? Uh, it's supposed to be it's supposed to be on an island, a restaurant on an island. Um, it doesn't actually say where it is. But this is imagine it. the twist that Gadget's talking about is like turns out a sign just falls off and it says Isla Nubla, and it's <laughs> Jurassic Park <laughs> Island. <laughs> Um, it, 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 be it's the place is supposed to be called Hawthorne Island is like an island that the restaurant owns and like all the restaurant staff live there they never, never leave the island um, which possibly makes mm. makes you understand why it all gets a little bit culty um, what, what, did, what snack did you have at the cinema? Uh, I don't eat at the cinema I just had a, really? I just had a coffee with a, with a film called The Menu, you didn't take some nachos in? No, because I, I, I don't like the sound of other people eating popcorn around me, so I don't eat when I'm in the cinema. Uh, good job. Good job. Good job. <laughs> I'm sat there, I was sat there with a massive load of food during June. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it was all right. I was, full, I was, full, of, I was full, of, full of cold and infecting you, so it was, it was fine. We, we, we paid, paid for each other that way. He did infect me that week. Jesus. I did. You shouldn't have been necking. Well, God. yeah, it's it it worth we'll seeing. It, it's one of those films I would say I actually see it at the cinema because I think on the big screen, like the cinematography, really does uh, stand out. It's not a film you need to see at the cinema, but I would say it'll be enhanced by seeing because it's nice to see those kind of films in cinema because you you expect to go into a popcorn thriller or something like that, don't you? Yeah, but when you see something a little bit different, it's sometimes a treat. Yeah, it's 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 playing with the. Um, Playing with the kind of genre conventions of kind of comedy of like black comedy and thrillers, yeah. um, in the same way that what happens within the film kind of plays with the concept of foodies and plays with um, the concept of kind of celebrity and celebrity chefs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not one hundred percent sure it sticks the ending perfectly, but I didn't leave dissatisfied. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but what you get out of the end, what you get out, of, especially the last ten minutes of it, it's fucking brilliant. Yeah. Um, it's a, it just it's just an escalation, and yeah, I I I definitely think even if you only watch it on like Amazon Prime or something, like that, make sure you see it because it is really really good. It's got a, it's got a, it, it's it's reviewed well. I think it's got like a ninety yeah. on Metacritic or something. I love Ray Fines when he's when he's proper putting his all into something. Oh, this well. is the most Ray Fines I've seen him in oh, a long he's so, time. He's so good, he's yeah. such a good actor. It's it it. Yeah, there's there's a lot of that kind of subtle acting that he's that, that he's very good at. You know, like how. He can have he can be very stony faced, but then like 
yeah. bit of wetness to his eyes. You know what's behind those eyes. He's not Francis Dollarhide from Red Dragon this time. No, and he's certainly <laughs> he's not eating Mo- paper. <laughs> no, and he's certainly not Moriarty from Holmes and Watson. No, no, exactly. <laughs> of Voldemort. <laughs> I like it. I, I like. I like. I, I like Ray Fiennes when he's proper going for it. Yeah, he's, he's, yeah. he's such a treasure. Mm. Bang into that then. Yeah, Brilliant. that's good. That's, has that been our weeks then, guys? It has. Right. So the main topic, as produced by our sexy patrons, they have decided what was the list against Stig, please, that they had the choice on. Thank you. I like how he hasn't written this song in between. So they had the choice of uh, we had uh, game franchises that started in the 80s, we had 80s icons, we had 80s. What was the other one? Something or other. <laughs> Hang on. I love how he hasn't got it written down. Remaking. Why 80s should films, I have this written it? down? He's the fucking host. Should have this written down. <laughs> it's called delegation. Remake an eighties film, wasn't it? Oh right, yeah. Remake an eighties film with with, tomorrow, with today's uh, actors, or um, make our own eighties film using only things that were available stuff. in the eighties. So yeah. actors, directors, uh, tech. All that kind of composers, whatever. Which, let me just say, patrons, you chose the correct answer. Yeah, with I think it was eighty <laughs> percent of the vote for that one. You they chose like, wisely. They like to make us put the work in, don't they? Oh, I will put the yeah. work in. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll get the ball rolling because I've, I, I've, I've, I, I know it's kind of cheating, but I've done two, but they're really small. What I've written down, so I can crack it out in ten minutes. Um, because I was thinking of this. We <laughs> ten minutes is a bit long, mate. Fucking hell! <laughs> say, We're doing it right. I am. That's what she said. <laughs> so yeah, um, think of you guys as a Hollywood studio, and I'm trying to picture these two film ideas. I really would like you to to finance at least one of them, if possible. So the first one's just the the pitch I did on the toilet. I'm having a poo, and I did this. So it's not as much effort into uh, as the second one. I mean, so if, I, if I'm a Hollywood executive and you're there pitching it to us while you're having a poo. No, 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 I pitched it. <laughs> I know. I, I know, wrote I know. the pitch on the park. No, you're not in the toilet watching me poo. <laughs> That'd be a weird meeting. <laughs> I get very shy as well. I'm like, oh, I can't come do come it. In, come in here. I've got a pitch for you. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody needs that. So, yes, the first film I want to pitch is something that was really big in the 80s in the uh, comic scene. Biggie knows this. The X Men, massive in the eighties, weren't they, Biggie? Huge. Still are. Yeah, absolutely. So the first film I want to pitch is X Men Magneto. Ooh, what? Ooh. So directed by James Cameron, he was on a roll in the eighties, <laughs> starring. <laughs> Oh, I've done this. Sylvester Stallone as Eric Lenscher, a.k.a. Magneto. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking, because he's Judge Dredd Elmer. <laughs> Does Stallone ever play bodies, though? I, I, this is the thing. So the film is a typical 80s way of getting absolutely everything wrong. For some reason, in the 80s, every time they did a superhero thing, really low budget, and they've just got everything wrong. So I've stuck with that. They think Magneto's the goody. <laughs> But they're still getting it wrong. Did you not hear my Black Adam review? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's why I mentioned it earlier. So it's a film about Magneto trying to help his fellow mutants build a utopia called Geniosia. But the dastardly evil Professor X, played by Sean Connery, and the other X-Men <laughs> are getting in his way. Because Professor X sounds like a baddie, doesn't it? He does, He's actually. A baddie. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so, I mean, I mean, you had an action man, a Dr. X. Dr. X, that's what I was just yeah, thinking. Yeah. Dr. X, <laughs> yeah. And he was, a, he was a bloody awful man. He used to put a, toxic I'd, waste in the sea. I had a, teach, a teacher that liked Dr. X, and he was an absolute <laughs> dickhead. You were a big awful, cybernetic awful guy. man. No, he just, he just had everything else. Looked, he looks just like Dr. X. <laughs> we used to call him Dr. X. <laughs> Perfect. So, yes, um, you may want to know which X-Men I've pitched. And remember, these are baddies as well. So, obviously, Sean Connery is playing Professor X. I feel like Sean Connery were good in 80s. Really, I mean, he's, he was great anyway. But in the eighties, he he was chomping the scenery a little bit, wasn't he? And stuff. And Very much. I think so. as a baddie, Professor X would be good at that. So I've got Wolverine, <laughs> played by Mel Gibson, with his <laughs> mullet. <laughs> so you've got to remember, guys, these are all in eighties. So um, Cyclops, played by Judge Reinhold, 
think it'd be a good <laughs> Scott Summers. Uh, Jean Grey, um, Leia Thompson from mm. uh, Back to the Future. Storm is Grace Jones. Who else could it have been? Who else could it Who have else? been? Nobody. Nobody. Nightcrawler. Now, David Bowie, I've put for Nightcrawler. <laughs> think how skinny he was in the 80s. Ah, the cocaine he is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, basically, um, I didn't really put much into this one. As I said, it's my toilet pitch. So, are you interested in that one at all? You can see where the story's going to go. It's been done a million times. No, <laughs> only only no? if there's like a beast and he's dressed up in like a like a big furry costume yeah. <laughs> and like a coat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And he's got, like, airy arms. Because <laughs> yeah, of CGI. Because yeah. there'd be no CGI, so he'd have to be made up with practical effects. Yeah. And well, that, pra- that was... And, and would need a practical effects juggernaut. Oh, yeah. That's true. That, the, he's just not in it, because it's too difficult to do. <laughs> he's just it, not in it, it. It's a bit costly of a film. Yeah. Uh, too much in it for 80s. But anyway, I, I, I don't know, if, 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 if Jim Cameron can do um, the, the alien queen fighting aliens, he can do a juggernaut suit. That's true, isn't it? Big, big, big um, Jim Henson juggernaut thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. can, we, can we have can we have Beast as a Muppet? <laughs> yeah, it's just a Muppet. Like Snuffleupagus. Oh, okay, so we're, we're actually we're going to turn this into an X Men Muppet film now. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm yeah. funding it. Fun, 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 fun. No, no guys, you, you guys are the Hollywood execs. If you, if you want to do that, but, you can buy it. You can buy still, the film. The Cookie Monster is the Beast. <laughs> but yeah, still perfect. having Sylvester Stallone as Magneto. Yes, 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 he's yeah. the only human in the whole <laughs> yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you want it, guys, you can have it. But let me pitch my main thing that I really, I really, re- I, I'm proud of this, and I've put a, a good bit of work in this. So the second film I'm going to pitch to you guys is a comedy buddy cop '80s banger because I think buddy cop films are '80s bread and butter. They really are, aren't they? And I bet at least one of you have done something similar to this. Yes, yes. <laughs> We've got very similar taste in films so far, so. <laughs> So, Kurt Russell will play the straight-laced, five-star, top-of-the-class hotshot called Detective Chad Marsh. He's sent by his police chief to escort a British embassy diplomat, Nigel T. Kettle, played by Ian Holmes. (laughs) They're travelling back to London and need a police escort, basically. Detective Marsh is great at his job, and the flight goes well, and he knows he's handling Nigel T. Kettle. He's handing him over to a metropolitan police detective called Horatio J. Bangers. So, <laughs> the, the hot-headed, constantly angry and pissed-off Met Police detective is played by Gary Oldman in a role of a lifetime. So, <laughs> so think of that. You've already seen it, eh? Kurt Russell, Gary Oldman. Boom, fish out of water. So when Chad Mash and Nigel T. Kettle get to Heathrow, shit kicks off. You laughing? <laughs> you laughing? T. Kettle. Oh, well, that's what Americans would call him. Kettle, it's got me. <laughs> that's what Americans would call him. It's the eighties; they didn't know anything. Oh yes, um, yeah. Shit kicks off. The bloody Russians start firing at Nigel just as the handover was happening. So Detective Chad Marsh and Horatio J. Bangers have to race around London together to keep Nigel T. Kettle alive. So it's a fish out of water buddy cop story because Kurt Russell is just so straight laced. He's a Republican American, and Gary Oldman has small man syndrome, basically, and just screams all the fucking time. Uh, there's a love interest in the film when Chad Mash meets Horatio J. Banger's sister, played by Helen Mirren, and just hilarity, mirth, and character growth happens, and the villain, oh, yes, you guessed it, it's the nasty Russian oligarch Petrov the Bear Pavlishev is played by <laughs> Mickey Rock. <laughs> the film is called Bangers and Mash, Directed by Paul Verhoeven. Oh fucking hell! <laughs> God, it's directed by Paul Verhoeven. Do you want to buy it, please? Yeah, Think I'm of in. it now. Yeah. So, like, like you, you've got obviously everyone's used to Kurt Russell being sexy with his hair and stuff. This is a trimmed. All his hair's trimmed. He's got glasses on. He's straight laced. And you've got Gary Oldman doing his Gary Oldman thing. You know when he's really loud on cocaine when he's just going. Rah! It's just, I think it's going to be sensational. Oh, it was back in the 80s when you financed it and it came out. But in the same vein as like Tango and Cash, Bangers and Mash. See where I'm going? Yes. Benson and Hedges. Benson and Hedges. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Peaches and Cream. Chip you and get Pin. it. <laughs> Chip and Pin. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that could be the sequel. Mm. 
pitching that. But yeah, do you like that? I do. Stig's all over it. He'd watch shit out of that. He knows you would. <laughs> Stig's already looking you for it on watch. Netflix. <laughs> it's got an IMDb <laughs> rating of 90. <laughs> Everyone loves it. <laughs> right, Candy. Right, You so look my... like you've just been fucking dragged out at 80s, mate. Oh, it's the hair. <laughs> Kicking and screaming. <laughs> and I wish I could go back. So my film is called Dead or Alive. <clears throat> so we open Beach up... Beach Volleyball. <laughs> no, not I that one. Remember, I just remember the last film Pitch Candy did about the... Uh... Yeah. G.I. Jane Austen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is, this is good. But, buckle up. Could be better. <clears throat> right, so we open up in a pizzeria slash games arcade. Brothers Mike and Tyler are fighting over a game of Gallagher. In the background, a waitress, Nancy, is skating around. She's taking everyone's orders, delivers shakes and pizza. We see Game Over flash up on the arcade machine. The boys decide to call it a night. They get on their BMXs and head home. Looking up at the sky and noticing it's starting to thunder and lightning. Nancy wipes over the remaining tables, says goodbye to the final punters and flips the clothes sign. She calls her boyfriend Chad, high school bully and wannabe rock rockstar. It's closed, you can come over now, she says. Cut to the boys arriving home to Mike's house. Weren't you supposed to get your mum some TV dinners without money? Tyler says. Where, where are they from? Sorry. Um, uh, to be decided. America. <laughs> Is that an American accent? Yes. <laughs> Why Shit, I've lost TV it. I must, it must have fallen out of my pocket at the arcade. I'm going to be in <laughs> oh, so no, much trouble. Now they're from the south. <laughs> back in Somerset again. <laughs> Mama Juju. What's we that have from to go the back office? and get it. <laughs> Listen, I think it's a great uh, American accent. and I won't have You would. Thank you. I've heard, heard against people doing American accents. That's how they sounded back in the 80s. <laughs> yeah, they did they did no, it's what strange yeah, things gets wrong with them having normal accents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do declare. <laughs> <laughs> so when they get back to the OK, they notice a weird glowing green light coming from inside. They drop their bikes to the ground and peek in the window. Inside, they see Nancy and Chad sitting on the floor inside a pentagram made of ketchup, doing some kind of ritual and chanting. <laughs> The green light they noticed is coming from a jukebox in the corner, but Nancy and Chad don't seem to have noticed they're distracted by the ritual. Suddenly a bolt of lightning hits the arcade, travels through electric wires, and the jukebox explodes with growing, glowing green tendrils, one of which hits Ooh. Chad and it appears to electrocute him, holding him up in the air while he vibrates with shock. Nancy runs for the fr- out for the front door. The boys catch up with her and ask what happened. We were trying to do a deal with Satan, she says. So that Chad could become a famous rock star, and now I think he's dead. <laughs> Let's get out of here, Mike says. You can stay with us tonight. So the next morning, Another. they head back to the arcade to find the remains of Chad. Nothing looks out of place. Everything seems normal. There's no sign of Chad. He must have gone. He must have gone home. Nancy says. <laughs> How about some shakes? So the boys have their shakes and pancakes, and they hang out at the arcade for a bit. As the morning goes on, it starts to get busier. Someone throws a dime in the jukebox. It glows a strange green and a light shoots out the front. Weird, the punter says, shrugging his shoulders. But then You Spin Me Right Round by Dead or Alive comes on, and they carry on. Later that evening, the boys are home once more, doing homework. A news flash comes from the TV. There's been several casualties at a local rock show this evening. Reports are hazy, but there appears to be some, someone in the building murdering concert goers. Stand by for local footage. Please be warned. This footage. <laughs> Please be warned. This video may be disturbing. Footage. <laughs> In the video, they see Chad glowing green and see-through. He's dressed as Pete Burns, but it de- it's definitely Chad's face. He has a huge BC Rich guitar, which he's firing out green tendrils of light at people, instantly killing them. Tyler picks up the phone. Nancy, have you seen the news? Yes, I'm watching it now. She says, "Meet me at the arcade." So, <laughs> so basically, Chad's demonic spirit is in the jukebox. Every time someone puts on a tune, his spirit escapes. He's dressed as someone from the band that he that was played, and he goes to terrorize oh. local rock shows. Tyler, Mike, and Nancy have the idea to put on a charity rock show where they know there's going to be a thunderstorm, one that Chad just can't resist. Nancy flicks into a flicks a dime into the jukebox, selects "How Soon Is Now" by the Smiths. And Chad Morrissey appears for a split second before heading towards the sound of a rumbling drum kit in the distance. Armed with meat feast pieces to, rep- to repel Chad Morrissey's guitar attacks, 
<laughs> it's killing time, the boys shout. <laughs> the gang managed to reflect enough of his demon energy back at him to weaken him. They hear an almighty crack from above as lightning as a lightning bolt hits the speaker directly, sending lightning up lightning up energy up into his guitar cord and killing him. So this is gonna be directed by Joel Schumacher, hot off the back of the Lost Boys. It's starring yes. Corey Haim and Corey Feldman as Mike and Tyler, Drew Barrymore nice. as Nancy, and Robert Downey Jr. as Chad. Oh, before prison. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking like weird science days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I like Excellent. it. What's it called again? Dead or Alive. Dead or Alive. Yeah, because of the band. Mm-hmm. So 80s Pete Burns, not early 90s Pete Burns. No. Not, no, no, not early noise. Yeah, 80s Pete Burns. <laughs> yeah, when you were good looking. Yes. Mm. Mm. I'm surprised they didn't try I, to beat like Chad it. to death with the crusts of the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> They're just handles, I declare. <laughs> please, 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 Candy, can we have these voices in uh, score sheep at some point? Maybe this like the second campaign or something like that. You play an Americanized teenager. <laughs> sure. <laughs> No, we said an American one, sure. not a Bristolian one. We'll we we bad we'll throat. We'll do it together, Candy. Miller, <laughs> Miller. <laughs> Brilliant. I like that. I like that a lot because that is exactly. I've seen that film a million times. You know what I mean? That is oh, yeah. what. That it's is eighties films. Yeah, I, I really like that. I really like that. Now, Biggie remembers the eighties better than we do, so I'm expecting good, lethal weapon style. Things from him. It's exactly what you're going to get. Of course, it's my movie it. is my movie is called Hong Kong Fury. Oh, <laughs> I thought you were going to call it non-lethal weapon or something like that. <laughs> Not lethal weapon. <laughs> yeah. It's called Diplomatic Immunity. No. Um, it's directed by Richard Donner. Yes, the choreography already. by Yuen Wu Ping. The score by Ennio Morricone. Oof. It starts. John called Van Damme as John Brackett's Jack Daniels. <laughs> nice. Brandon Lee as Officer Fong Lee. Mm. Steven Seagal as the Dragon Lord boss, Reese Taylor. <laughs> is he Russian in this? Is he Chinese in this? Or is he. He's, he's trying to be Chinese. Native Michael American. Michael Dudikoff. In this. <laughs> Scott back Michaels. in the 80s, they'd get away with making him, having him be Chinese and dressed yeah. up as Chinese, wouldn't they? Yeah, of they would. He likes to pretend he's Chinese all the time. <laughs> Gary Daniels as Dealer mm-hmm. One. Bello Young as his body, one. one of the bodyguards. <laughs> Ewan Biao as uh, Dealer Two. And an uncredited <laughs> Sam Lowe, which will become clearer <coughs> later on. The mm. drug war has escalated in the US with a new product on the market that's taken over. It's called Dragonfire. Following a lead, New York detective John Jack Daniels and his partner Scott are doing a stakeout deal between two rival gangs, the Dragon Lords and the Jade Emperors. Disturbance breaks out at the floating Chinese restaurants at a New York pier, undisclosed location. A massive brawl erupts and it gets worse when one of the gangs, the Dragon Lords, suddenly inhale this new type of drug. Enraged with an almost unstoppable strength, they go berserk and brutally take out the rival gang. They discover who's in control of the dragon fire is Reese Taylor. As the bosses escape, whilst the detectives are caught up in this fight, uh, Jack's partner, Michaels, is disarmed and killed by Reese with some Aikido maneuvers and a death hand killing blow. Reese d- uh, escapes and has apparently left New York and gone to take his business to Hong Kong. Jack Daniels has been given authorization to go to Hong Kong and meet with the local Hong Kong drug force and their captain, Officer Lee. He's a by the book kind of guy. JD and Lee in clash uh, at the beginning as they disagree on their approaches on how to find Reese. It's like a fish out of water kind of scenario. You know it, boy. As Lee shows JD around Hong Kong, there's banter and bonding as they start to learn how Hong Kong works and how things are done there. A dealer in a local market is arrested after another brief fight. Giving them the lead, the laundrette factory is actually in the shantytown is a front for drug manufacturing. Another big fight breaks out one of the bosses is captured. It reveals that Reese is actually now hiding out at one of the big, biggest casinos in town, owned by millionaire Sam Lowe. He's an old mm. Chinese-looking guy that's sort of wearing traditional Hong Kong outfit, long grey yeah. hair, long beard. A car chase Reese's randomly ensues. 
through the streets of Hong Kong, and the two detectives barely survive this, but using their smarts, they finally arrive at the casino. They try to intimidate this Sam Lowe. He invites them in. They can't find anything. Just as they're about to leave, one of the henchmen is spotted taken as he uh, takes over from one of the other dealers at one of the tables. And a huge fight breaks out. It's chaos. Stunts everywhere throughout the casino. And then as JD finally defeats Reese, he reveals that he's not actually the real boss. Sam Lowe appears, pulls off his mask, and is revealed to be none other than Jackie Chan, the real boss, the real villain. There's a no massive way. fight between... I didn't see this coming. There's a massive fight... <laughs> as Jackie Chan takes on both of them, but eventually, after lots of martial arts maneuvers, you name it, they finally take him down. And they end of the movie. That's it. That's I don't believe I it, because I don't think anyone can take Jackie Chan down. <laughs> Unbelievable. But actually also, put him as a villain, because I don't think he's ever played a villain before. So I put him also, in. No, and I reckon he could. I reckon what, he could, actually. When do Riggs and Murtaugh turn up? Yeah. That. <laughs> There's cameos of them. Look, pointing at them going, hey, hey. Oh, okay, fair enough. <laughs> It screams Asian panic to me, this film, and I'm in. It's, it screams that slightly racist 80s, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Exactly what I'm going for. But yeah, yeah uh, I can't describe every stunt and every, you know how it is. It's all just fights, fights, fights. And the Could you do an a- animatic of it, please, for us, and send it in next week? <laughs> yeah. Like, like a full breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, that's nice. my movie. Yeah, we saw that coming a mile off. Um, let's take what you got. Well, you, you better, you'll better you have seen this coming a mile off as well. Strap in. <laughs> We're wrapping in again. We've got three buddy cop movies. It's all I know. It's all I know, mate. <laughs> right, here we go. So, set in LA around 87, 88. We open with the panning shots flying over the city in it into cut with uh, clips of a vehicle travelling through the streets. So we see major tourist mm. spots from the ground perspective, from the aerial shots. There's people out enjoying themselves. You know, typical downtown LA. The city is lively. It's constantly cutting back between the two. We have some proper 80s style pop synth playing over, like like very much in the Frankie Goes to Hollywood I talked about last week. Bang into that. The vehicle moves out the city and into Beverly Hills, and it pulls up outside a big house. Inside, we see a handsome young man and a beautiful lady having a good time, dancing, drinking, snorting coke, all that kind of stuff. Beautiful. Two men, played by Clancy Brown and Michael Ironside, step out of the vehicle and ring the yes. doorbell. <laughs> the gentleman answers and is immediately blasted away with a shotgun. Yes! <laughs> the woman Stop sc- spoiling it! Put it on, I want to watch it! <laughs> the woman screams and is chased by the men. She tries to run, but as I say, she's chased. She, she manages to catch Ironside's um, character, known as Dax, in the face with a knife. But Clancy, oh, Brown's, char- Dax. Clancy Brown's character, Leon, hits her over the head and knocks her out. Cut to the title scene. Strong target. Strong target. Yes. <laughs> it's the next day, and we awake with a police detective by the name of Harry Strong. See it? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Bangers and that. <laughs> <laughs> Played by Sylvester Stallone. He's a bit of a yes! slow at home. Nothing seems kept. He picks up last night's takeaway and eats it for breakfast and swigs a beer. He gets a phone call about something, grumbles, and says, I'll be right there. <laughs> That's my Sloan. <laughs> After a quick shower, he gets himself in his blue wash jeans, plate white tee, tucked in, of course, and brown jacket. He scrubs up pretty well. He goes outside, and of course, he's got a classic 1968 Ford Mustang. He sticks on his big glasses and drives to the crime scene. Mm. He arrives at the crime scene. He's met by Chief of Police Ray Jones, played by Lewis Gossett Jr. Now, if you don't know who that is, oh. have a look at him. He, he, would, he just looks like the perfect kind of person to play the chief boss. Yes, um, I, I know. I know him. I know yeah. who he is. And, yeah. Oh yeah, I see it. Yep. Yeah. Also, there, there's two other detectives, Mike Sinclair, bit played by Bill Paxton, and his uh, partner Ross Smith. Game over, man. Played by Ernie Hudson. They inform oh, Harry about what's happened here last night, and the man was found dead. But the Hollywood actress Emily Saint Marie is missing, presumed abducted. As if this case wasn't as important enough, what makes it higher profile is the man that she was with has known links to gang members around the city. But also, she's the daughter of wealthy businessman Richard Clark, played by Ronnie Cox, aka Dick Jones from Robocop. <laughs> yep. He's also running yep. for Senator soon, so this needs to be sorted out as soon as possible. Such a slime bag, I hate him. Harry is told to team up with Sinclair and Smith, but he refuses. He prefers to work alone. This is because yes. he's a loose cannon. He'll bend and break <laughs> the rules to get the answers he's after. He tells Chief Jones he'll, 
he'll get this sorted in no time and goes to crack some skulls. We get scenes of him around local gangs. He knows asking if they've seen anything. There's a chase sequence with one of them, but it all leads to nothing. So he goes back to the station. The chief informs Harry that because of the severity of the case, the FBI are bringing in a man to help. Harry isn't impressed. So I don't need no pencil pushing dweeb in a suit slowing me down. He hasn't noticed the man mm-hmm. in the corner in the office. The chief tells Strong to say hello to John Target of the FBI. Target stands up and he says, Nice to meet you. Yes! That's right. We're getting the team up that we never got in the 80s that we should have had. <laughs> We're getting John Target is Arnold Schwarzenegger. Gosh. He says, this, this is the guy? Harry exclaims as he puffs out his chest and shoulders a little bit. Um, he says, I mean, yeah, sure, he looks tough, but look at that suit and square haircut. He screams doing things by the book. The chief says, well, maybe you need to do things a little by the book. <laughs> Thus, You're a loose cannon. We have a buddy cop movie where Stallone plays the rogue, Arnie plays a straight man, but eventually as the film progresses, Arnie's character starts to loosen up, cracks a few dry jokes, even has to get mm. dressed up at one point by Stallone getting him to blend in, just for comedy lols. dressed up as a woman. No, just, you know, dressing up in street <laughs> clothes and stuff where he looks completely yeah. out of sorts. Uh, there'll yeah. be a scene in Harry's apartment where they go there and John's like, look at this mess and squalor you live in. And he's like, hey, it's not too bad. Has he got a bit of a belly in this? Like he did in Copland? No, no, they're both massive. <laughs> yeah, they're both huge <laughs> monsters. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there'll, be, there'll be a scene where John, beat, John and Harry beat up about 12 guys hand to hand by themselves as they're surrounded. There'll be chases through warehouses with guns and drugs being shipped into lots of explosions, Loads of boxes shootings. Again. Yeah, boxes smashing through windows, all of that. We'll have a scene where Harry and John go to speak to Richard Clark, who they think comes off as fake and feel like there's something that doesn't add up. So they try to mm. pursue this, but they're told they're looking up the wrong tree and they're warned off him because of his Clark's political connections. But yes. they ignore this and continue to pursue him. Sneak around the even house. they've been told. Yeah, even though they've been told. Finding oh. out what looks like some docu- documents for shipping containers. This <sighs> lands them in hot water and they're both suspended. Clark tells the police he doesn't want to pr- uh, press charges. When the police leave, he shuts the door. And who should be with him? None other but Leon and Drax. Would you believe it that Ronnie Cox is the bad no. guy of this film? Who did Never. see that coming? <laughs> Such a shock. Dax is also now sporting an eye patch, by the way, because of the knife yeah, attack. Yeah, makes him look even more ruthless. Yep. Round up the film, so not, not one for following rules. Harry decides to take matters into his own hands, but John says he can't because it'll ruin his FBI career. So Harry tells John he's going to follow up on that shipping container lead and sets off to find answers. But when he gets there, Dax sneaks up behind him with a gun, points at his head, and he's captured. So he gets tied up and beaten up by Dax and Leon. They try to get answers out of him. All he does is laugh at them, crunk crack jokes about Dax looking like a pirate. <laughs> After a while, the two leave and tell the goons to finish him off and dispose of the body. But wouldn't you know it, John turns up and helps and saves the day, backed up by uh, the other two policemen, the Sinclair and Smith. They take out all the goons and Harry and John chase after Leon and Dax. They come up to a... Um, where am I? Yeah, they chase them to a super yacht where they have a big fight. And, yes. and then Harry sees... Clark and John tells him, go after him, I've got this. And then we get Arnold fighting at Ironside and Clancy Brown by himself. They obviously Easy. get the upper hand a little bit, but then he kills one of them by booting one through a window who lands and he lands on some well placed spikes outside. And then what the does other... he say when he does that? Oh, I didn't have a line. I wish I had a thought. I, I can't think of good lines. Uh, but there, have there a is a nice trip. Yeah, there, there, there's going to be one liners and everything with this. And then he manages to kill the other one by just getting him in a neck hold and just crunching his neck and snapping it. You get that audible snap that you get in there. Have a break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Harry chases Clark into the bedroom where he picks up Emily and holds a gun to her head. We then get the classic bad guy tells all. He said it was supposed to be a yeah. simple kidnapping job. And while the police and the media were spending their time looking for the high profile actress, Emily St. Clair. I was going to move a fuck ton of drugs and guns around and make, m- make <laughs> millions helping me with my push for senator. The kidnapping would have been the icing on the cake and garnered the sympathy votes to get me the votes I needed. But you and that knucklehead from the FBI had to ruin it all. So now I'm going to have to kill you and you, sweetie. Sorry, but there can be no witnesses. <laughs> she bites his hand because she, she wasn't privy to this. He's kidnapped his own daughter for his own political gain. Wow. So she bites his hand, gets free, and Clark blasts him away and he says, 
I'm afraid you don't have my vote. Everything wraps up nicely, <laughs> as per the end of a buddy cop film, and Harry and John say their goodbyes, and as he's driving away, Harry cracks a joke and laughs. Freeze frame on Arnie laughing, cue power ballad. <laughs> <laughs> I like Wh- it. Which, which power ballad? I don't know any of them. White Snake. <laughs> Here I go again. <laughs> yes, yeah. any, anything. Uh, so yeah, I've, this is also directed by Richard Donner, so he's a busy man in the, eight, in the 80s. It's good, it's good that, and I love it, and it's so, like, I mean, that's the plot of Beverly Hills Cop, minus there's two of them, <laughs> but it's still good. <clears throat> I'm bang into it. I couldn't remember Proper them. bang into I, it. Is that the, uh, I genuinely yeah. don't know if it is. I, I just wrote this off. With warehouses head. and everything. Yeah, there's always warehouses. <laughs> yeah, it's easy to film in a warehouse, isn't it? That's right. Yep, lots of big empty warehouses all across LA. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. A slightly yeah. damp. Known floors. place for warehouses. <laughs> you want warehouses? We got warehouses of warehouses. <laughs> also, L is excellent. Um, LA is on the water, isn't it? Yeah, good. Because yeah. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> <laughs> West coast, west coast, mate. Oh no, it's in California, but I was thinking it. Anyway, no, it is on the coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's my Arnie and Stallone team up. I'm banging to it. I would watch the shit out of that constantly. Brilliant. Um, Gadget, you don't watch many 80s films, do you? I've, I've seen a fair few 80s films, and I decided to challenge myself this time, because every time we do one of these pitch things, I always do something like dark and sci-fi or something like that. Yeah, you do. So I decided to go the complete opposite and do... A romantic a, comedy. Not a romantic comedy, but a comedy. Oh. So my film is going to be called uh, White Russian. <laughs> I know where this is going. Written and directed by Mel Brooks. Oh, I don't know where this is going. <laughs> Starring as Will Nelson, Steve Martin. As Igor Volklov, Martin Short. Yes, as Pyotr Sokolo, Gene Wilder. <laughs> yeah. As nice. Anya Fedora, Catherine O'Hara. Mm-hmm. As President Grigorev, John Candy. <laughs> oh, no. And guesting as General Goldberg, Mel Brooks himself. Yeah, he does that. He does that a lot. He He likes to pop into his own films. So, Will Nelson is one of the CIA's greatest spies. He's known as an expert in undercover operations. He's a man with a thousand faces, capable of inserting himself into any organisation or group he puts his mind to. (laughs) An order comes down from the President to secure intelligence on Soviet nuclear secrets, whilst whilst, uh, President Grigorev is distracted by the war in Afghanistan. I think he'd probably end up doing a made-up country rather than doing the actual war in Afghanistan, but we're just going to use Afghanistan because I couldn't think of something. So General Goldberg hands the mission to Nelson personally. He tells him, through a slightly, a slightly farcical back-and-forth conversation, to connect with a double agent named Volkov who will help him get into the Soviet Union and supply him with fake documents. After your typical travel montage, Nelson is on a train to Moscow. Volkov greets him on the train, being very excited to meet an American for the first time, and notably... No one in this film is using Russian accents. (laughs) Under his Soviet military uniform, he's wearing American flag underwear, which he's very excited to show Nelson, much to his irritation. (laughs) He hands over the fake documents and tells him when they get to Moscow, he'll take Nelson to where he needs to go. He also points out that Nelson sounds like he's named after Willie Nelson, much to his annoyance. (laughs) Meanwhile, Grigorev is trying to understand why the war is taking so long. John Candy will play him as being kind of impatient and incompetent, owing to the slightly propagandish nature of any films involving the Soviet Union that American studios made. Uh, Sokolo is Grigorov's right-hand general and keeps telling me everything he wants to hear while ultimately either not having any clue what's going on or not caring. You know, that way that Gene Wilder can just disregard anything that he wants to. After a change of clothes into a, a Soviet uniform, Nelson walks into the military offices in Moscow with Volkov. He's met by Fedora, a young capricious woman who instantly catches his eye. Volkov introduces Nelson as an investigator sent from the presidential office to check into a suspected leak of intelligence. Fedora leads Nelson into the archive room, cueing a comedic physical comedy sequence of Nelson attempting to covertly photograph documents whilst trying to keep Fedora distracted between himself and Volkov, uh, as she keeps kind of hovering around and discussing how terrible it would be if spies got into this room. In the documents, Nelson discovers that the Russians are using the war in Afghanistan to try and expand the Union, but also as a smokescreen to hide their renewed nuclear expansion. The documents are signed off by Sokolo. Nelson tells Volkov he needs to get closer to Sokolo. As they leave, Fedora is suspicious and goes to the archive to double-check what he was doing. Sokolo complains to his assistant that Grigorov is getting on his nerves. 
All the questions are just wasting his time, and he missed the days when the president wasn't interested in what the army was doing and when a general could just do whatever he wanted. As if on command, Grigorov interrupts him and asks him more pointless questions, causing Sokolo to have to bite his tongue. When Grigorov leaves, Sokolo picks up the phone, uh, and it's Fedora calling him to tell him about a strange man doing an audit. Sokolo tells her to find out who he is and to tail him. Volkov takes Nelson out on the town. They do shots of vodka in a music hall, listening to a lounge band. Volkov is drunk and constantly asking questions about America, causing Nelson to tell him to can it in case anybody hears. Fedora walks in, looking stunning, which gets Nelson's attention. They flirt and end up doing a choreographed dance together, resulting in a kiss. She tells him he kisses like an American, to which a drunk Volkov says as he walks past, well, that's because he is. This ends up in a chase scene as Nelson and Volkov have to escape through the streets of Moscow in a larder, being chased by police and soldiers in tanks. Because of course... in a larder. (laughs) (laughs) They argue in the car and Nelson tells Volkov to get lost as he's almost blown his cover. He drops Volkov near the military officers and drives off to find a phone to report his findings to General Goldberg. Because he doesn't know if public phones are being listened to, he uses code to speak with Goldberg, but Goldberg has the wrong page of the cipher, causing a circular back and forth of coded uh, coded (laughs) phrases, which would end up making some sense to the the listener, but no sense to them. Yeah. Volkov mopes towards his office and overhears Sokolo and Fedora together. She says she's found the spy and they know where he is. They're going to get him and throw him into a gulag. Cute evil laughter. Nelson tries to sleep in the safe house that Volkov has uh, provided him, but the room is stormed by police, some of them in riot armour. They ask his real name, which results in another Willie Nelson joke. They take Nelson to a police station and tell him he's going to be taken to Siberia in the morning. They leave him with two riot armoured officers as guards. One of the guards taunts Nelson until the other guard clocks him and knocks him out, revealing himself to be Volkov, who in, cost- in disguise, who helps him break out in costume. They head to the Duma and try to stop Sokolo. Nelson brings out his expert spy skills, again, another physical comedy section, as he sneaks past the guards and all the people in, in the open in the Duma, while Volkov watches impressed. Volkov then just walks through because no one gives a shit, because they're in Soviet <laughs> uniforms, and no one checks. Mm. They found, find Sokolo in his office with Fedora. He monologues whilst Nelson looks bored. He calls Volkov a traitor, uh, Volkov a traitor, but Volkov says the US is the greatest country in the world and communism sucks, because it's a fucking propaganda film. <laughs> <laughs> Adora pulls a gun on Nelson and then a fight a fight breaks out and one of those really campy 80s fights where they're just kind of holding the gun and like passing it back and forth kind of thing that they always oh, tend yeah. to do in those films. <laughs> Whilst the four of them fight, Grigorov walks in the door, looks them over and just watches, looking confused. Volkov knocks out Fedora and tosses the gun to Nelson. Nelson tells Sokolo it's over, that he's going to reveal to the world what the Soviet Union are doing in Afghanistan and around the world. Grigorov finally announces himself and Nelson explains what Sokolo has been hiding from him. Grigorov is concerned about igniting the Cold War and asks what he can do to keep everything quiet. Nelson smiles and we cut to Sokolo in a Siberian gulag. We then cut to Nelson and Volkov in New York, on the ferry to see the Statue of Liberty, to which Volkov says, I thought it would be bigger. The camera pans away from the ferry as the two of them start to bicker. And we roll the credits. I fucking (laughs) love it. I love it. I genuinely love it. I think it's sensational. Um, You've got to get that. Go on. It, 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 it's one of those things that like Mel Brooks never really did a war film or he never did anything kind of he didn't touch it did he really no he didn't he, I mean he did like he did a, like what was it The Brief History of the World or something like that yeah yeah. Um, which touched on some of that stuff but he's never did anything like that and I think like the idea I, I, I don't know why he's never done like a send up of a spy film because like, remember at the time if he did this in the late 80s there were loads of Bond films that he could have taken inspiration from and there was uh, Cold War Panic still Still there and stuff. So yeah, perfect, and wouldn't it? and Steve Martin and Martin Short were on like their star was just ascending at the time as well. Yeah, yeah. You've got to get you've got to get that perfect blend of Mel Brooks style hilarity, innuendo, but it's not technically offensive, especially not for the time anyway. Yeah. Is, is it the, oh, that's good. I like it. I really like it. Excellent. Brill, 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 brill. That's everyone, isn't it? It isn't is. It? So. As always, links to all our extracurricular activities are in the show notes and at modernescapism.co.uk. And please consider becoming a patron to help support our endeavour and be a producer every month. What? Mm. Uh, next week, we have Stig's magic hat or whatever it is. What is it, Stig? What are we doing? It's a bowl. <laughs> it's a bowl. <laughs> I have a no bowl. expenses spared. <coughs> magic bowl. It's a plastic bowl with a baby Yoda. Just explain what we're doing. Baby Yoda in it, I know you can't see that. It's a good idea, and 
It frightens me, really. <laughs> it scares the shit so out of me. We have ideas every week of what we want to do. We've had we have a thing where we just throw ideas into it and we thought why loads. not open it up to everyone else to suggest a main topic and we throw them yep. all into a hat and we just pick it random. Usually at this point we've already decided what we're gonna do. Yeah, we, we have usually, no idea. Yeah, we have no idea what this is gonna be. So this can't actually it could be a listener one, it could be one from that we've submitted. This is like everyone's has gone into the hat. And I will this pull it ridiculous. out. This is ridiculous. This is absolutely. There's too much power. This yeah. is too much power. <laughs> also, before I do this, Oodles, I'd just like to say, Beverly Hills Cop. The only similarities are warehouses. I looked it up. Well, <laughs> I didn't rip it off. <laughs> you sat and watched it. <laughs> no, I just did a quick <laughs> Wikipedia. <laughs> right. So, so no one think knows. Like, accuses me of cheating. Here it is. They're all in here. I'm gonna reach in. Really, really shallow hat. Man. He's closing his eyes. Look, I'm closing my <laughs> eyes. I, no, I don't want anyone accusing me of cheating and picking one of my own. This one here. No. Oh no! Here we go. This too much power. They're all his own. Oh. Ooh. Oh. This one comes from the host. So, are we worst. doing this next this, week? This is what we're doing. Yeah. This is this is one of yours. Is it? This is one of your suggestions. I think you'll like this one oh. because it'll give you a little chance to have a little rant. I don't get it. The things that the majority love that you just can't figure out why. Yes. Oh, I wanted to do this for years. Yeah. <laughs> I don't get it. So, yeah, we, we basically will all come in with something that is either a fad or a trend or something just hyper popular that you just haven't. Yeah. Or you film just can't grasp it. God, just... Oodles, you'll be on for hours because you don't get anything. <laughs> no, I don't. You know, the things that get posted in our Discord and you go, I don't know what that is. I don't get it. Why is it like that? <laughs> <laughs> Why are people like this? Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. If oh, there's a, it's a film, a game, something, yeah. music, uh, something that you just, you do not get why this thing is popular. Yeah. Why do you listen to this podcast, <laughs> you idiots? It's going to be a, it's gonna be a ranty episode, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yes. And, then, and then the week after, we're doing another one. We're all going to fall out. Yeah, we'll pick another one next week. So if you want to get them in there. Um, oh, no. <laughs> If we get more listener ones, seriously, if you, if you all throw us your ideas, I'll take our ideas out so it's listener only. But you need to yeah. get, get them to us. Stop being lazy yeah, and I mean, give us your ideas. And we're not being lazy asking yeah. you for ideas before you accuse us of that. This is a concept <laughs> that we are honouring. Um, yep. the, the thing is, though, um, not, when we ask the listeners to send in questions, that's different. This is you're pitching a feature. Make sure yeah. you're not just saying, what apple are you? If you were a fruit or whatever, I don't know. That's not that's not a feature, guys. That's not a feature's work. We've got idea. to get half an hour out of it. Yeah, no. there's a lot of biggie ideas that don't make the cut. Yeah, I'm a granny. He's like, if you could be an animal, what would it be? I'm not talking about half an hour. How I want to be a scorpion. It's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> not doing it, biggie. So, last thing before we close up shop for the non-patrons, Friday the 16th is going to be oh the live. Office Christmas party. Yay. Number three. Oh, it's the one it's the, it's the one where Club Alang turns up. Oof. It's, <laughs> it's the third one. It could be messy. Uh Stig's it will got be messy. well into Guinness. He's got well into Guinness this year, so he's gonna have loads of Guinness. Farting, burping, it's gonna be sensational. Secret Santa. Secret Santa. Yeah. Who's getting the oh. shit gift this year? Exactly. Who is getting a shit gift this year? Ooh, I, I can't wait. I can't wait. We love our office Christmas party. Um, I mean, if you're watching it live, like, phew, Candy takes a top off and everything. I do. It's wild. Yeah. She puts a bum on the photocopier. It's worth It's worth tuning in for, trust me. Be there. Bring your own booze. Yeah, we don't provide booze to your house. <laughs> You've got to bring your own. <laughs> we, we, we actually interact with the chat while we're doing it. It's just mayhem. It's mayhem. I think we did like a three and a half hour one last year. It was quite long, yeah. I don't remember the end of <laughs> yeah. it. There's Not a good like, hour do. that I don't recall at all. Yeah, it's all, it's all right. The first time we did it, Stig doesn't remember any of the end of it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we, we will mention it on every show leading up to the 16th, just to remind you all that, yes, that is our live Christmas party. It's going to be terrible, but also great content. So, yeah, if you are not a patron, this is the end of the show for you. For patrons, we'll meet you in the green room in a second. So, good night. Bye. <laughs> Oh,
I don't know. He's got a proper strange Harold name. Harold Faltermeyer. Faltermeyer, that's it. <laughs> he knows it. Wish that came up with a fucking pub quiz. <laughs> he wouldn't have got it anyway. You'd have gone... <laughs> 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 The same guy that did the uh, Top Gun anthem. Yes. Oh man, I swear, Biggie, it was. It just made me laugh. I, 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 just, <laughs> I kept, I kept just pot, like muting everyone else and just listening to you. Just, you just go. <laughs> 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 